it gets registered in the local DNS too. So uh, if you want to become the WPAT server for the entire network, you can either just do NetBIOS name, you run like NMBD or just change your host name to be WPAD, or you can just run dhbcd-hwpad. And now the local DNS server will tell everyone, not just your local subnet, hey, this guy over here is a WPAD server. Everyone go over here and give him your shells. And that's what we're about to go cover. So this talk is about hijacking NTLM, or this part of the talk is about hijacking NTLM. Uh, the goal of this is to quickly own every local workstation. You can do variants of this attack to actually exploit external hosts to do it against, you know, internal hosts connecting back out. There's a billion different ways to kind of permutate this. We're going to talk about the most common case where you're already sitting down on the local network or you already have control of a DNS resolution for the client. Either you've got a, you know, I'll go into details here in a second. But this is kind of just a new twist on SMB Relay, which is a tool that's been around since 2001. It's a really nice tool considering how much code it was. It was like 80,000 lines or something like that. It's just obscene. Or 80K, so probably less the number of lines. But it was still painful. Um, so yeah, we actually implemented almost everything in, in SMB Relay 2 into Metasploit now, and it's actually readable Ruby code. It's not just you know giant ass C++ file that only compiles on Windows now. So the first step, you got a man in the middle all outbound web traffic. There's lots of ways to do this. We talked about a couple of them, which is cache poisoning via bind 9, via birthday or PRNG. Um, you can specify WPAD via DHCP. You can specify WPAD via NetBIOS name. Lots of different ways you can basically make yourself a WPAD server. Um, if you're lazy, you can do plain old ARP spoofing, call it done. And that's pretty straightforward. And then run, you know, transparent proxying and redirect it back to local service. Um, or you can just run a rogue Wi-Fi access point. And at that point, you use something like Karma to say, yeah, I'm WPAD, come through me, go through me. Or just relay all the connections going through your own host. So this is the first step. It's not that hard to do. And for the most part, you can do this with a billion different techniques. We won't go into it too much. Second step, this is actually optional. So if you're running against, if you're trying to target a browser that has a concept of the internet zone being more secure than the internet zone, uh, for example, IIS 6, some versions, I had to do this, I don't know why. Um, the first thing you do once you become the proxy, once you actually run this proxy or have control of their HTTP connection, is you redirect them back to a host called, you know, intranet or something with only one host name in it. And once you do that, then you can redirect them back to the next stage. But that gets around the zone restrictions of redirecting users to a UNC path from an internet host. So that's some security fix went in that blocked that, and this is the way back around it. And you can do WPAD plus a SOC server, which is what I'm about to demonstrate. Or we can do squid transparent or just 302. Lots of ways to do it. So finally, this is how you actually get them to connect to your SMB server. Um, the first example, which is every version of IE I know of, you just do image source, backslash, backslash, IP, share, and anything. And they'll go ahead and connect and do the whole damn thing. It's pretty straightforward. And a lot of folks may have tried this before and had issues with it, and the tricks for it are actually making them think they're talking to their own client. And I'll talk about how that works in a bit. Basically, you say, yeah, I'm your own host name. Yep, I'm you. Please, tell me all about ourselves. And they do that. <laughs> um, Firefox. So Firefox has a security model that says, we aren't allowed to redirect users to UNC Pass. It's a bad thing. We're going to disallow that. And they, they tried to. And then they, they failed miserably. And one thing they failed miserably at blocking was the Mose icon URL. This is also the alternate way to exploit uh, the ANI vulnerability on Windows via Firefox. Is basically, it's a way to specify, give me the image that corresponds to the file with this extension. But it'll actually go through and pass this off to the file system layer before it does that. So what happens here is you do Mose icon file, excuse me, Mose icon dash URL colon file slash 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 slash. And that tells us to go to a UNC path. So it's kind of this weird kind of backdoor way to do it in Firefox that is patched in 2004. There's actually one way that isn't patched, but I can't talk about it, and that's going to get patched in 2005. So basically, Internet Explorer, Firefox, you're still screwed. You can still get redirected to a UNC path right now. If neither of these work for some reason, you can also embed UNC paths to all sorts of third-party applications. You can put them inside of you know, PDFs. You can put them inside of uh, Flash files and redirect them that way. Um, you can put them into Windows Media files. Say, oh, the codec is stored on this UNC path. So you can embed these things everywhere. So the goal of all these different things we're doing, all we're really trying to do is get this user to connect to our SMB server. And the reason for that is now it gets fun. So as we said before, um, to exploit this, we accept the SMB connection coming in. We say, hey, I got a client. And then you figure out where you want to take that client. You only have one shot at this piece, at least. So you say, what server do I want to have authentication credentials on? So at that point, you either target you the PDC, you target uh, another workstation you need to get access to, or you target their own system, which is by far the easiest way to do it, and what we're going to demo here. Um, once you've accepted the connection from the client, and you connect back to your target server, you ask the target server for the challenge key. And now you pass that challenge key back onto the connecting client. 
you let the client authenticate, and during that process, you do things like you know tell them your host name is their host name, and just echo things back to them so they, they feel comfortable and warm and fuzzy, and then you break their neck. So, uh, and then you lose your microphone apparently. Here you go. Uh, so yeah, you pet the bunny, pet the bunny, pet the bunny, and here's how we do it. So at this point, you've got an authenticated session to an SMB host, and you disconnect the original client. And you use the authenticated session to do something evil. If you have administrative access, like you bust, you know, as an administrator trying to browse the web via the browser, um, you basically just connect to admin dollar. You then use the service control manager. You use you connect to admin dollar. You take your shell code, stick it into an executable, upload it to admin dollar, which has also become system root in Windows. And then you use the service control manager to create a new service and start that service using that file. So basically, this is exactly how PS exec works. And yes, there is now PS exec built into Metasploit. So you just use exploit, Windows, SMB, PS exec, give it the username and password, and bam, you can run shellcode on a remote host with username and password now. Um, the neat thing about the SMB stack and Metasploit is we don't actually need the real password. You can just give us the hash. So if you don't feel like cracking your hash before using it to run shellcode in someone's system, you don't have to. Um, you can just use interpreter to one box, type hash dump or use PW dump to get the raw lamin hash. And in the SMB parameters, we do SMB user and SMB pass. Just pass the whole damn hash in there as the password. We'll recognize that that's a hash and go, excuse me, we'll recognize that that's a hash and go ahead and use that as part of the authentication. So now you can just use the dumped hash passwords from anything without even bothering to crack it and immediately go run shellcode in some other box using that hash. So to roll back on this stuff, okay, so at this point we've got, uh, we've got PS exec. We can run whatever shellcode we want and I may be completely full of crap. So now we're going to demo it to make sure I'm not. So the first thing we do is we have a Windows XP system over here that is fully patched. And if I had an internet access like a show, yes, there's no updates available for your system and you know all hunky dory over here. So our IP address is 172.16.233.130. Um, if we open up Internet Explorer 7, the latest, most secure version of the web browser from Windows, from Microsoft, <laughs> uh, about, yeah, yeah, it's actually the latest version, nothing fancy here. All I'm showing is like we're not doing anything, there's no default setting that we're not setting, we're not changing anything. It's basically, this is how it works. So here we go, automatically detect settings, which is actually the default. I unchecked it from a previous demo, so ignore that piece. Um, so automatically detect settings, close out, okay, okay, not a big deal. Um, done, done, done. Alrighty, so first thing we want to do over here is set up our Samba version, which will tell everyone on the local subnet that our name is WPAD. The way we do that, and it's probably hard to read, but you can just listen to me if you uh, can't see it. As we set, uh, let's see. In your smb.conf file, there's a parameter called netbios name, and you just want to set that to wpad. And then all you do is write nmbd, and you're done. So you're now the wpad server. It's nmbd. Now to prove that, that works, we go back over here, and we just type wpad. And it should do a DNS lookup, and it should, sure, it should do a local netbios name lookup, and there we go. It found out that dot one is now wpad, because it did a host name lookup and all that. Uh, kind of a weird bug with Windows, or I don't even know if it's a bug or not. Um, you know how DNS has a transaction ID that is supposed to be kind of random and hard to guess? Well, NetBio's name lookup is also have a transaction ID, and it's sequential. So for whatever that's worth, you can actually spoof a NetBio's response to somebody, which doesn't seem like it's really worth much, but if you ever need it, that's there too. So now we know the WPAD is now set up. So the next thing we want to do is start our web server. And our web server is going to host a single file called WPAD.dat. And the cool thing about wpad.dat file is it's just a JavaScript function. It's a JavaScript function called find proxy for URL. And from here you determine based on the URL they specify what proxy server they should use. So we're going to be lazy and say for every single server out there, just go through 172.16.233.1, which is my IP address, and a port 1080. So straightforward, done. The cool thing about this technique is that this JavaScript will run even if they have JavaScript disabled. Doesn't matter. It's kind of, it's a little bit locked down, like you can't do certain operations from the side of it, at least with IE7, but you may be able to do some things that still allow you to pop normal IE vulnerabilities before they even get to a web page. All right, so this was a little bit tricky because it's, Gen2 is trying to fight me on this. So Apache CTL start, get HTTP colon colon, localhost wpad.dat. Basically saying, yeah, it actually returns the right URL. So yeah, my web server works, yeah, it returns wpad.dat. So at this point, I'm running, um, my host name is set to be w, uh, WPAD because of the NetBIOS name daemon. I'm running a web server that serves up WPAD.dat, and that web server now says, now use the SOX proxy. So I have to go run the SOX proxy, and 
I'm lazy and I don't like actually writing my own sock servers or setting them up, so uh, I just kind of stole a whole bunch of the Metasploit code to do it. So one of the cool options of MSF console is dash R, which says, hey, just run all these commands in a row. And since I'm a lazy ass, I just did that. So first thing I did is take a little socks proxy that was like 10 lines of code, and I'll open it up so you can see what it does. Uh, MSF3, modules. This isn't part of the main tree yet, but it will be soon. Models, auxiliary, server, socks. All right, so the font's really small, but the basic idea, and I'm going to try to scroll down here real quick so you can see it. We, we basically parse the socks request, make sure we know what they're trying to do. And then at the very bottom, all we do is print out this little chunk of HTML saying, thank you for playing, welcome to the evil proxy, and get an image tag to image source equal backslash backslash RIP address again and a share name. So all we're doing is no matter what website they try to browse, when they use our proxy, we return the same web page that says, hey, load this image file from this uh, SMB server. So pretty straightforward. So now what we're going to do is, and the second part of this exploit you can see, the second part of the RC file, is we use an exploit called SMB Relay. And then we set it to use shell reverse TCP. So give me a reverse connection. Then we set our L host. We then set our L ports and our exploit. That is says what host and port to connect back on for a reverse shell. So pretty straightforward. All we do now is just run MSF console. And you have to do it as root because it has to bind on 139 for uh, the fake SMB server. So sorry, but until we have some magic way to bind to low ports on Unix, you have to run this thing as root. So kick that up, and it may take a few seconds to load up all the modules, read its configuration file, get rolling, things like that. And here we do, we have our, our Sox proxy spawned off in the background. Um, we loaded our SMB relay exploit, that also went in the background. We tap jobs, we can see we've got two modules in the background, one that's a Sox proxy, one that's a relay. So we're just running both from inside Metasploit. To make sure they all work, first thing we do is gonna tell it to our Sox proxy, make sure it's actually up. Yep, we got a Sox proxy, it's good. Now tell it to our uh, local SMB server. Yep, it's good, we're all set. And at this point, all the client's done is open up their browser and make sure they've got, you know, auto detect proxy set up. And uh, we just go browse the internet. And you go, da 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 da, I want to go see, I don't know. Microsoft. Microsoft. Microsoft's cool. We like them. <laughs> so you wait a little bit. So what it's doing now is it, reserves, it resolves WPAD, realizes that it's my host, and then once it realizes that WPAD is my host, it grabs WPAD.dat. Parse the JavaScript function, runs that, says, okay, I have to use the Sox proxy at this address to get to that site, connects to that Sox proxy, says, I want to get to this site. And we say, okay, great, you're connected to it. Go ahead. And we give them an HTML web page that says, okay, now you need to load image source equal backslash, 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 et cetera. So it's kind of slow over here, probably because it's doing things over here. And, aw, come on. Maybe tell it into the Sox proxy first and didn't make it happy. And most of this code is like a week old, so bear with it. We're gonna just do it one more time. Work Thursday. And we're also going to sniff the local network to figure out what the hell it's doing in the background. And VM at 8. There we go. So everything's up and running over again over here. We're not going to tell it to it in case that's what broke it last time. Let's see, make sure our WPAD server is still reachable. Yep. Open up Internet Explorer again. Options, verified all there. Land settings, automatically detect. Yep, all good. And 